if we're going to back it up a little bit, we're going to have to back it up a little bit before we get into more specifics about war and the spiritual dynamic at work in bringing about a war. Why does a war ultimately break out? There's an answer to that from the Orthodox perspective. But to get there, we've got to, first of all, see a few things about what it means to be a Christian. What it means to, to, to be uh, in this perspective that we say is a presupposition for us to properly understand things spiritually. So we're going to read through quickly this famous letter to the Ognitas, which helps us very much to understand the position and place of a Christian in this world. And I'll go quickly, so pay attention. I've got some basic points on the right in the next three slides for you to get the basic points that I'm going to be reading. So if you lose track of what I'm saying, just look over on the right four basic points from this first page, and keep those in mind as we go forward. Christians are indistinguishable from other men, either by nationality, language, or customs. So automatically, there's just tons we could talk about right there. Philatism uh, is, of course, a delusion uh, of some Orthodox Christians today, where they uh, see their church as purely uh, something that belongs to one nation or one people, as opposed to something that is uh, for all peoples. So it's kind of a repeat of the error of the Judaizers. We have that temptation throughout church history. In any case, Christians are indistinguishable, it says here, from other men, either by nationality, language, or customs. We don't, that's not a problem. It's not an issue for us. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own or speak a strange dialect or follow some outlandish way of life. Their teaching is not based upon reveries inspired by the curiosity of men. In other words, one could think of maybe the, the Gnostics of the day, I don't know. And unlike, unlike some other people, they champion no purely human doctrine. Key point we'll come back to. With regard to dress, food, and manner of life in general, they follow the customs of whatever city they happen to be living in, whether it is Greek in their, that day or foreign, non-Greek in, in the Greek-speaking world at the time. Yet there is something extraordinary about their lives. What separates them? So what, what is common is the externals. What's different is the internal way of life. The love, of course, the Lord says, they will know you are my disciples by your love, but much more than, than that. That can be not much more than that, but that can be misunderstood today in this uh, age of uh, superficial and fake love that is uh, promoted. Uh, they live in their own countries as though they were only passing through. So we have a, another city. We have no abiding city here. They play their full role as citizens, but labor under all the disabilities of aliens, as foreigners. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. So they're in, but not of the world. They're in Greece. They're in Russia, but they're not they don't see that, that as their homeland. Ultimately, their homeland is in heaven, right? They're passing through this. Like others, they marry and have children, but they do not expose them. In other words, they do not commit abortion. That's very interesting, isn't it? right there, very basic. They don't, they don't expose them. They don't throw them out, basically, is what, how, how they would commit abortion in those days. They share meals, but not their wives. They don't fornicate. They're not adulterer, adulterous. So they're not ideologues, they're not philatists, they don't commit abortion, and they don't commit fornication and adultery like the pagan people at the time. They live in the flesh, but they're not governed by the de desires of the flesh. That should set people immediately apart, the Christians from all the re rest of the world today, which is given over so often to fleshly desires. They pass their days upon earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Christians love all men, but all men persecute them. It was a given that you're going to be persecuted as a Christian, of course, in those days. And it's coming again in many places throughout the world. Condemned because they are not understood, they are put to death, but raised to life again. So it's a given that Christians are not understood. Don't, don't, don't expect people to understand what you're doing, what, how you're living, what it means. They live in poverty. But enrich many. You see, they don't seek after riches. They're not among the rich and famous of the world. They are totally destitute, but possess an abundance of everything. Reminds us of St. Paul's famous words. They, dis they suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. Their dishonor from the world is their glory. 
They are defamed but vindicated. A blessing is their answer to abuse, deference their response to insult. For the good they do, they receive the punishment of malefactors, but even then they rejoice as though receiving the gift of life. They are attacked by the Jews as aliens, strangers. They are persecuted by the Greeks, and yet no one can explain the reason for this hatred. Such a good letter to reread and again and again and again and remind ourselves how far we are as poor uh, Ogdoites, 8th century Christians, to this great height that is being described here. So we're not legalists. We understand and accept that we're going to be despised and rejected by the world. We're not greedy. We don't seek riches in this world. God uh, gives us what we need when we seek the kingdom of God. And we're not vengeful. We don't go after anyone. We forgive and we love our enemies. Finally, the last part of the letter. To speak in general terms, we may see that the Christian is to the world what the soul is to the body. As the soul is present in every part of the body while remaining distinct from it, Christians are found in all the cities of the world, but cannot be identified with the world. They're not identifying themselves with a particular city or a particular ideology or a particular uh, political party or a particular country, right? The world, generally, all that is of this world, they don't identify with that. So that's how they're going to get the perspective on what's really the cause of sin and war. That's why I'm reading this right now. You've got to be in this perspective to see things. Otherwise, you're going to be attached to this world in its many, many forms. And you're not going to see properly what's going on in the world. As the visible body contains the invisible soul, so Christians are seen living in the world, but their religious life, their spiritual life remains unseen. They'll go flaunting it. They're not on the internet with... Their divine liturgies, they, they turn it off before they get to the gospel, after the gospel. The body hates, at least in that would be good if we did that today. The body hates the soul and wars against it. Not because of any injury the soul has done to it, but because of the restriction the soul places on its pleasures. Very interesting and important for us today. Let me read that again. The body hates the soul, right? The body hate, hate in the, is properly understood here, right? The body hates the soul and wars against it. The flesh properly understood here. Not because of any injury the soul has done to it, but because of the restriction the soul places on its pleasures. Similarly, the world hates the Christians, not because they have done any wrong, but because they are opposed to its enjoyments, right? Its enjoyments in the sense of its vain pursuits, right? That's what he means here. Christians love those who hate them just as the soul loves the body. We love those who hate us, the Lord says, love our enemy. And all its members despite this loves the body and all its members despite the body's hatred. It is by the soul enclosed within the body that the body is held together. And similarly, it is by the Christians detained in the world as in a prison that the world is held together. The soul, though immortal, has a mortal dwelling place. And Christians, who also, also live for a time amidst perishable things while awaiting the freedom from change and decay that will be theirs in heaven. As the soul benefits from the deprivation of food and drink, so Christians flourish under persecution. We've said in our lectures many times that the church is doing the work and the, is being the body of Christ in this world when we have offering up martyrs and confessors and ascetics. That's when the body of Christ is truly exemplary and being shown forth, just as he says here. Christians flourish under persecution. Such is the Christian's lofty and divinely appointed function. The role of Christians, the lofty and divinely appointed, for which the Christian is not permitted to excuse himself. So they're not moralist Christians. They don't stop in the morality. They go deeper. They're not boastful. They're not hedonists, of course, and they're not ambitious. They don't seek things on this earth as uh, rewards. 